Hello, my name is Pete Gerlach. I am a professional family systems therapist. I've been doing that for 32 years. And as part of that, for 19 years, I have been studying recovery from early childhood trauma, abuse, abandonment, and neglect. I've worked with over a thousand men and women of all types uh, who are troubled as persons, as couples, as parents, trying to help them help themselves find a way to live a better life. And one of the ways that I have found uh, through the teaching of many other people, not just myself, is that an important component of healing from significant childhood trauma is spirituality, personal spirituality. Obviously, this is a very complex subject. I don't propose to be an expert on it, but I do want to offer in this video a fundamental question to you in case you are interested in recovering or reducing psychological wounds because of a traumatic childhood. If you are a grown, wounded child, particularly if you're a parent, I propose that it's useful to spend some time becoming aware of is your spirituality toxic or is it nurturing? I propose uh, some ideas that will allow you to explore this question and answer it in your own way. <clears throat> For perspective, note a reality. Many millions of people around the world have found that the Alcoholics Anonymous 12-step philosophy and many variations of that are successful at helping them break crippling addictions to substances and moods and relationships. A core part of the 12-part philosophy is belief in a non-denominational higher power. The 12 steps don't preach how to believe or what to believe, but they encourage people who do believe how to use that belief towards achieving sobriety and serenity and productivity. I think there's a um, illustration for all of us in that reality. The larger reality is people who are not addicted but who are psychologically wounded also can benefit from what I would call nourishing or nurturing spirituality. The alternatives are um, spiritual indifference or unawareness or spiritual cynicism. Please note, I am making a clear distinction here between religion, which is a man-made collection of things like uh, how to worship, where to worship, churches, an organization, a credo, a holy book, prophets, um, some religions include uh, heaven or versions of heaven, hell or versions of hell, demons, the devil. Those are all religious man-made creations. Some will argue that holy books validate their reality. That's a personal decision. I'm talking about spirituality, which is different than religion. Spirituality, as I'm speaking of it here, broadly means unshaking faith, unshakable faith in a spiritual, one or more spiritual beings. I want to slant that and say it does not include, for my purposes here, belief in benign or terrifying spiritual beings like ghosts, devils, or demons. I am not including that in my version of spirituality. You are free to do what you wish with that. When I say spirituality here, I mean faith in a power greater than human beings 
whatever its source or form that can provide for at least four or five vital human needs. The needs in simplest form are these. A benign higher power, whatever the denomination. Belief in such a benign higher power can provide for people. A way of believing, I am not alone. Aloneness is a terrifying legacy from having been abandoned by your parents or adults when you're a child. It's terrifying. It's crippling. Belief in a benign, interactive, available higher power can offset that feeling and say, I am not alone. A manifestation of that also is a belief in a higher power offers community with other human beings that can offset the terrifying, demoralizing feeling of being isolated and alone with your stress, your fear, your guilt, and your shame. Another thing that belief in a benign higher power provides is the faith, not proof, faith. Someone really cares about me. Many of us grew up in households where that was a rare thing. A third thing that belief in a benign higher power provides is the reassurance and the comfort. I can pray, I can meditate, I can think, I can ask, I can request, and there is a chance or a certainty that I will get protection, inspiration, and relief with the problems and stresses in my life. People who did not grow up in a nurturing household often have never known those feelings and faith in a benign higher power can provide them. A key adjective or adjunct to that is with my faith in a higher power, no matter what happens, I am safe or safe enough. You will have your own reflections on these. I don't propose to make this absolute or cut into stone. What I'm saying is, please meditate on, if you believe in a benign higher power, what benefits does that give you? Right? I simply use these as illustrations. <clears throat> the major point I want to make here is a professional therapist who works with trauma recoverers, which I have done myself, by the way, since 1986. Personal spirituality and family spirituality, if any, can be, can range from toxic to nourishing. Toxic spirituality, personal or family spirituality, if it's toxic, it promotes Shame, guilt, fear, confusion, and rigidity. Any kind of belief system, with or without religious practices to go along with it, that promotes those psychological wounds, in my opinion, is toxic. The converse is any spirituality or spiritual belief, personal or family, that promotes self-confidence, self and mutual love, serenity and security and healing. That is nurturing or nourishing spirituality. The details vary throughout the ages and through different cultures and persons so there are lots and lots of variations, but those I propose are the themes of toxic spirituality and nourishing spirituality. Let's take a closer look at where does toxic spirituality come from. I propose it comes from childhood, early childhood. There is such a thing, I believe, as spiritual neglect by adults charged with the responsibility of raising young children. What is that? Spiritual neglect is 
uh, not modeling for children the aspect of spirituality that is intrinsic to human life. Adults who don't talk about spirituality, who don't demonstrate it, who don't illustrate it, who don't instruct in it, who don't encourage children to be curious about it, that, in my opinion, is spiritual neglect. You're welcome, of course, to your own opinion about that. If you grow up in a household that is not spiritual, that potentially will stifle or hinder or block healthy spiritual growth, which is an essential for healing from psychological wounds. There is also such a thing as spiritual abuse. Abuse is, briefly, where one person um, fills their own needs in a way that harms another person who is dependent on them. Spiritual abuse happens, usually unconsciously, when an adult, a mother, a father, a grandparent, older person, uses spirituality, as in the fear of hell, the fear of eternal damnation, the fear of devils, the fear of sin, the fear of eternal judgment and damnation, uses that those images to a vulnerable young child to force the child to obey the adult. There are many variations, but the theme is the adult is getting their needs met at the expense of the security and the holistic health of a young, defenseless, naive child. That is spiritual slash religious abuse. One third thing to be aware of is there is such a thing as spiritual or religious addiction. It's a variation of codependence, which is a relationship addiction. A very famous book back in the 1980s woke people up to this concept. It was called uh, When God Becomes a Drug by Father Leo Booth, who was an Episcopalian priest who was in recovery from personal wounds, psychological wounds. So there is such a thing as over-focusing and over-dependency on spirituality or religion or worship or rituals or ecstasy. Any of the many combinations of those things can obliterate healthy awareness of the rest of your life and living a balanced, serene, productive, healthy life and seeking your true purpose. So spirituality can be toxic, can be fostered by spiritual neglect in childhood, spiritual abuse, and spiritual addiction. As you may know, in case you are seeking recovery and relief from psychological wounds, recovery, personal recovery, is scary and it's confusing. One reason that a healthy, benign, nourishing spirituality can really help move through recovery fears and recovery confusions is because, as I said, healthy spirituality promotes I'm not alone, I can get help, I can pray and meditate and hope for relief and direction, I am safe no matter where I am or what I'm doing. My point here is an opinion, you're free to disagree, Spirituality is a major asset, even a requisite, for successful recovery from psychological wounds. It raises the question for you, whether you are in recovery or not, what is your spirituality? Is it toxic? Does it exist at all? Is it nourishing? Do you need to do something about that? If so, what? It also raises the question if you're a parent. What kind of spirituality, if any, are you modeling for your children and what are you teaching them about spirituality? Are you encouraging their spiritual growth and awareness? Uh, I would like to urge you for more information on this very complex subject to read two articles on my nonprofit ad-free website. Here are the links to each one of them. 
One of them explores the difference between spirituality and religion. One of them goes into more detail than I have here on what is toxic spirituality and what is nourishing spirituality, and so what. So here are the links to two articles that I hope you will take the time to read. Meanwhile, um, may your spirituality nourish you today and beyond. Thanks for watching.